because I want to respond to Arusha's need for that I chose choosing glide. That when I came here and I needed to, you know, I was in the process of getting my master's degree, the San Francisco State strike happened while I was working here and while I was getting my master's degree, and I had to choose which, which I was going to commit my life to. Um, and I decided that it was much more exciting and much more meaningful for me to choose Glide um, because this is where I could do something. This is where um, life was happening. This is where it wasn't, you know, life wasn't being given to me or presented to me in a book. This was where I could do something to make a difference. And I felt that. I felt that because there was so much that needed to be done. There was so much that, you know, there were so many needs that, that, and I'm not saying so many needs out of a, you know, kind of maternalistic point of view, but, but rather there are many, many things that were wrong with our society. There were so many things, so many young people that were out there without a home and without parents and without love and without guidance. There were so many people out there without food and without goods and without shelter. And, you know, here was the opportunity. Here was the place where, you know, not only was I in discovery of a community, but I was also in, in discovery of opportunity to make a difference. And that, what, that's a very, very um, seductive and enticing uh, choice to make because it's scary on one hand, and on the other hand, it's, it's like stepping off of a cliff and having the faith that you're somehow going to be caught by a wind and carried off and you can fly. And I, and I, I, I felt instinctively that this guy who was taking down the cross, this Cecil Williams who was taking down the cross, this crazy you know, radical minister who is, who is like tearing up the, the walls of the church was going to fly. And I, I thought, well, you know, that's a pretty good tailwind there. Um, but I, I think it took me a, a few years before I could find my own, my own wings. I, I think it took me a few years before I really felt that I could assert my own voice. Um, I had to go through the emotion, or I had to go through the action, I had to go through the struggle. That's what it is. I had to go through the struggle of, of rebelling. I had to go through the struggle of rejecting, you know, the old values and old middle class norms that I thought would make me acceptable. I had to reject the fact that I thought, you know, bleaching my skin would make me whiter and and um, you know, do, you know, like straightening my hair and, and, and being, you know, cute and having tits and you know, all of that would make me a more acceptable woman and therefore more acceptable to a man who can make me more visible. And I had to go through rejecting that. I had to go through saying, no, that's crap. That is not true. But I, you know, you don't, you don't step through the shower and suddenly emerge as a different person. You go through the whole torture and the struggle of bleaching your skin and tape, scotch taping your eyes and wanting to be occidental and wearing the pads and the and the not, and trying to be, you know, the 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 sex model of the of the moment um, before you realize, ha ha, this is futile. <laughs> no matter what I do, I can't look any more Caucasian than I than than I am, and I'm not. So, you know, I just, it it. Uh, it, 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 took, it took a while to get to that place where, I mean, I could just put that down and say, no, 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 you know, enough of that. I need to be, love me for me. But I had to go through the revolution of it. I had to go through the San Francisco ethnic study strike. I had to go through watching the African-American struggle, the Black Panthers, Angela Davis, the uh, assertion of um, Latin American community, the assertion of, you know, the struggle with the uh, International Hotel, the, you know, creation of all of the Asian organizations and Asian and Japanese American and Asian American organizations that emerged, you know, working with youth, working with elderly, working with the different community groups. 
that I had to go through that. I had to go through loving, learning to love my people and learning to love myself. That was majorly, majorly a struggle. I said I chose to be here because she, it was beautiful. Sure. She, she exactly answered your question. Here. And then also again, just just I don't know if you went over it, but just I think it was interesting that you came here. And it, you know, people don't know if you came here and got married just some sort of way. Or oh yeah, do you want to say a little bit about the, the how yeah. it was a partnership or it became a partner? I'm not sure exactly. Mm -hmm. A little bit about. And Jan, just just so you know, uh, we do if the time is sort of running out a little bit. So it is. How much time do we have left? I mean, I can keep on thinking. Yeah, because I have to get this equipment back to the oh, wow. Okay, so how much time? How much time, time do we have? 15, 20 minutes. Are you serious? She has to say, okay, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Okay. okay. I have to, yeah, I kind of have to be wrapped by a little bit after five. Yeah. It's, but it's four ten right now, right? That was my test. And that's just four. Oh, yeah, four. Okay, so. So 20 is okay. We're just going to go and get a couple of things, but. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so Cecil, I mean, the partnership. Okay. If you can take it back to I, somewhere right after I chose Glide. And then, or, or, or yeah. Yeah, I, would, 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 I met this guy, you know, who was like uh, tearing down the car. He, and Cecil is also struggling with his own identity, that he, as an African-American man, um, you know, who, who had marched with King and who, you know, had, to, who was, a minister of the United Methodist Church was himself creating such a, a stir because again he was tearing down the walls of the traditional church. He was what? Trying to stay with me because I'm closest to the Okay. He was tearing down the, the walls of the traditional church. He was opening the doors and telling everybody to come in. I mean the hookers, the the pimps, the the drug addicts, the the people who were out in the streets, the hungry, from every margin, every community that had felt rejected or that had felt that they were not acceptable to white middle class America or mainstream America, they were coming through the doors. I mean, it was like, I don't know, Noah's Ark. It was like, it was like a, 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 a movement. That's all I can say, it was a movement. People were coming through these doors and they were creating a community of people who are saying, we affirm who we are, we are beginning to find our power, we are finding our voices, we are finding each other, we are finding a way in which we can empower each other. It was, you know, it was a very radical, wonderful, alive time. Because again, there was that simultaneity of movements that, was, that were happening, the anti-war movement, the student movement, the women's movements, the, all the various cultural uh, communities who are in movement, who are in motion to create their place here, to, to, to put their stake in the ground um, in terms of who they authentically and truly were in America. That America is not just for one segment of the population. America is for everyone. America is for. I don't want you to look. Okay, there. America. <laughs> America. I mean, you know, America is is not the melting pot. It is the fire pot. It's the, it's the, it's the kettle where all the vegetables stay intact, and you know, all the flavors are authentically uh, real and different, and it is it is the celebration of that. To get us to see so to you. So here was this guy who was taking down the cross and he was tearing down the walls and all these people were coming in and and he was telling me that I was acceptable. Now this is uh, this was kind of a wild concept for someone who felt pretty invisible. And I saw my visibility through the people that we were working with, whether it was the gay and lesbian kids, or whether it was the gay and lesbian transgender bisexual community, whether it was the poor, whether it was, you know, anyone who felt marginalized, people of color, um, the hungry. These were the people who were my community. And his community, they were our people. And he made this space for all of us. 
and to create in. And this is, this is where that opportunity was, to create anew, to create oneself, to invent oneself anew. Through the action, through the programs, through the, through the doing, through making, pro- making a place where people could, be, uh, help, could help themselves, where they could, again, unravel that knot of who they are, um, of who they weren't, into who they really are and find those threads to connect. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just, um, you said it's one people. I didn't see I know. I, I want, I I'm want getting there. I'm getting there. Okay. If you, okay. Yeah, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Um, and Cecil and I were working together for a few years, and I was really basically being his assistant for a few years. And then when we began to, to really solidify some of the programs, I think that's when we, we forged our for- partnership. I think that's when we realized, because we did talk a lot and we found an enormous amount of comfort and enormous amount of reinforcement and enormous amount of support in that talking with each other and sharing the vision. And I think it is in realizing that our visions were very, very similar and very parallel that we forged a partnership. And his struggle was a very lonely struggle. I mean, he, he, was, he was pretty vilified by the... Um, United Methodist Church, as you can understand. Uh, and there were people who did not like the way in which he revolutionized this church. They, they did not like the non-traditional manner in which he was uh, uh, creating community I'm here. Did you, was there a moment you like, fell in love with him? Way down the line. Way down the line, okay. I loved him. I loved Cecil. Cecil was, Cecil is what's not to love. He's a very lovable guy. He is a vi- and he truly does live his love. He does live his unconditional love. And of course we had our disagreements and our struggles. And the, and the fact that more and more as I found my voice, he was showing me that, you know, I wouldn't get killed or I wouldn't die for asserting my voice. I think that that's when the mutuality of the relationship began to come alive. And it's when my voice found its power. Uh, and it was through the work, it was through um, the work, I mean, and particularly through the work that we, the programs we built from the 60s into the 80s, that um, he and I forged this partnership to serve the poor, because that was not Glyde's priority before, prior to his time here. And again, the church was a place where people gathered, and where I found I had a place, where I found I could contribute something. So. The, even in the celebrations, the differences in, in which we created the ritual, like I brought in poetry, I brought in my poetry, and we celebrated poetry of, of the voices of people from the different communities. We celebrated diversity. We celebrated, you know, the radical voices in um, theology. So here was this very fertile, very rich place, this safe sanctuary that, where the voices could come alive. Um, and it was in 1982 that we, Cecil and I, Cecil married me and my first husband. This was in 1960. You can laugh and have, you know, I, 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 would love for you, I would love for you to say that again, and not, you don't have to laugh. But I was just envisioning the end of this, like I want you to, you don't have to just be perfect in this. This is like get to know jam. Yeah, okay. So, so well, if I can just lay back and just, yeah. yeah. You, can, you, can, you can just say a little bit, because we're going come to come to an end, and it might end on something. I mean, you, you're a funny woman, too. I mean, you, you're like, I mean, you can be all of you right now. So, okay. So well, so tell, you, tell us a, a short story of maybe you, you and Cecil. Yeah, and when did it, or just you should start. Yeah, but I'd love if you could start with you married. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm trying to think of the moment. So excuse me for a second. Um, Well, when I first came to Glide, I was a mess. You know, I was a mess. I was a train wreck. I was an accident. I was you know, not only not knowing who I was, I, I was drinking too much, I was, you know, just in a relationship that I, you know, didn't, I, of course, set myself up to fail in, etc. And then, 
um, when the person who was to become my husband and I reconciled our relationship, we decided to get married, and Cecil married my first husband and me. So that was um, interesting. Um, and the marriage didn't last very long. <laughs> I, I, did, I did have a, I mean, the marriage was okay. Uh, marriage was fine. It was not a violent relationship at all. He was a very kind person, a good dad. But, you know, we just kind of grew apart, as many marriages do. Uh, and I have a beautiful daughter as a, as a result of that first marriage. Um, but, and, and I was a single mom for about eight years. Uh, and, gee, I, I think there are a lot of parallels that I felt and identified with my own mother. The, the loneliness, the kind of vulnerability, uh, the difficulties and you know, being able to manage a household and um, keeping it together with a job that wasn't very high praying. <laughs> but um, I hope we don't use that. I mean, you know, just the difficulties of single motherhood. And again, Cecil and I, you know, the, the whole evolution of Jan was the struggle, was, you know, like a reinvention of myself through every crisis and through every situation that I found myself having to overcome. And if it's, it was, you know, like struggling as a single mom, trying to find the voice, and that's when I began organizing, actually, I began organizing the anthologies and the voices of different writers of color, and we became a collective. That is when I discovered a lot of these beautiful women of color who felt the same way I did about myself in, as being less than or being not acceptable. And, you know, that it was finding that community also that was so empowering. And it was really in a ways in which we affirmed our own cultures that strengthened me a great deal. Um, and I think that the strengthening of myself through that process strengthened my relationship with Cecil as a partner, as someone who was equal, as someone who had a vision of her own about what I wanted to see happen at Glide, began programs with uh, women in health and women um, from the streets, women in um, need of uh, education around STDs and safe sex and so forth. And we, I began programs with um, people in recovery. We started our recovery program in the 80s. And that was a very important time in the early 80s when um, we began our, when crack cocaine became epidemic in San Francisco and well, in most er urban areas. And we began recovery with not just the crack cocaine community or the people who are addicted to crack cocaine, but people who are suffering from many, many other addictions that included powerlessness, you know, abuse in their lives, um, chronic homelessness, etc. And so I began working with women around recovery that uh, opened the door to my seeing my own need for recovery around the incest and the abuse. And I broke my silence in 1982. It was the year that uh, Cecil and I got married. And Cecil said, you know, would you mind if I told the con congregation uh, how it feels to be married to an incest survivor? And I said, well, probably would be co better coming from me, you know, just for me to tell my story with that help. And he says, yeah, and before I knew it, I was standing there in front of this congregation telling the story about the abuse. And I remember describing it as being an insect, feeling like an insect impaled um, on paraffin. And, um, and how that, because I, I would collect insects, uh, being raised on a farm. And that image of, of the impaled insect being helpless and wriggling was the image that came to mind. And I shared that with the community. I thought, oh my God, no one's going to speak to me again because it's going to be just, you know, it's a horrible thing to reveal. No one, you know, it's so shameful. And after I told my story, we saw all these women and men standing up and saying, I want to tell my story. We're going to pause for a second. It was beautiful. I didn't want to interrupt you. Uh, we gotta, we're going to powder you a little bit. Got my divorce and, again, was a single mom for eight years. Um, 
I leaned upon him very heavily as a friend to help me get through that crisis, as I leaned upon other friends to, you know, the community of women that we created here that helped me through that crisis. But we, then, and then he became a single father, and he was divorced, and five years later, you know, it was, there was this 15 year period of time where we did not, you know, we were not, we were, we were partners in the work. And we began dating after, um, I would say that while he was getting his divorce, we were dating. And we were very, very close friends, though. And so to say that that moment where we realized, gee, you know, I think we should get married, um, we were both very, very burned by our feelings about marriage. Both Cecil and I felt that we, you know, I, I felt like I didn't want to get married again. And he was not eager to jump the boom. Um, and then when he did propose, it was like in 1981, and he proposed on the freeway. He said, why don't we get married? So, and we, we decided to live together for two years prior to that time. So we announced to the congregation that we were going to, we decided to move in together, to live together. And he had his children, I had my daughter, and there was this, you know, search for a place that was going to be big enough for both of us, and then the announcement to the congregation, at which point everybody stood up and cheered. It was amazing. Um, two years later, you know, he proposes on the, on, the, on the freeway, and I'm going, you know, this isn't really the most romantic place to propose. But, okay, okay. Um, and we talked to our kids, and, and they, they were really quite wonderful about our partnership. Um, and we got married in 1982. And it was not enough. We didn't, it wasn't enough just to have one minister marry us. It took a rabbi an African uh, Episcopal minister and a United Methodist <laughs> minister to marry us. And we, um, the, bu the city donated buses and took us all over to the, to the reception in Japantown. And um, it, was a great, it was a great ceremony and a great uh, celebration. And the wedding ceremony had my dance group in it and it had the Glide Ensemble in it. Cecil sang. And he wore a fuchsia shirt, which totally upstaged everybody, including the bride. But um, it was a grand celebration, and we had a great time at the uh, Kabuki, at that time Kabuki reception hall. So, um, yeah, the, the wedding was a great coming together of various communities. Uh, the mayor, Feinstein, at that time held a reception for us at her home. And, it was interesting because we did invite everybody. We invited, I mean, everybody from different communities. And my friends from the Filipino community who are traditionally late, they were the first ones there. And, you know, I remember Freddie the Manong with his banjo, and he <laughs> played his banjo. And um, I think the mayor was concerned that maybe we wouldn't have civic leaders, but a, a lot of civic leaders were there. It was, it was, our marriage was as interesting, probably, as, as any other time in our lives. But, um, yeah. So I'm just going to flash you way forward now to today. And just to, because we do that, we have, and what I would love for you to have to la last thing you would like to say, too. But just, who, who's, who's Jan today? What are you about today? I mean, where, and where do you, you want to go? Who's Jan today? I think um, who I am today is about continuing the journey to reinvent myself, to continue to create myself, to um, discover recovery. I think it's a perpetual journey. And my commitment to working with people, uh, to provide wherever I can the opportunities for empowerment for them and for them to empower themselves, particularly women and children and young people. I think that, you know, we've got, we live in a society where the priorities are so misplaced 
and we're in a time of war and a time of turmoil and a time where violence seems to be more prevalent than ever. And I think it is now that more than ever we need to find alternative and unique ways of healing ourselves and of finding community that truly accepts and truly gives the message that we love one another and that it is more productive to love one another than to fight and, and to go to war. I mean, not only abroad, but in our neighborhoods, in our communities. And I think people, I, I truly am of the belief that when people are affirmed and believe in themselves and feel accepted and feel that they are part of something that is just bigger than themselves, that they are more giving and more um, productive. And when they, when they feel that someone else believes in them, whether it is Glide or whether it is, you know, the broader community out there, that they will, that they will succeed, that they can succeed, that they will be, they have the courage, they will then have the courage to take that extra step, to take that one step forward that is the positive step forward for themselves to empower themselves. They will accept the opportunity to go to school, or they will accept the opportunity to learn the computer, or they will accept the opportunity to learn a trade. That, to me, is the hope for our people for all of the people in the margins. And for women, particularly, I think it is important for women to believe that people care enough that we can support each other to break those cycles that destroy us. So whether it is in violence, or whether it is in abuse, whether it is in poverty, whether it is in homelessness, whether it is in just not feeling good about yourself, I think that what, I, what my vision is, is to, to say always to women that you are beautiful and you are good enough and what you do for yourself to empower yourself is going to be a benefit to not just yourself but to your children and to the community. That it isn't just about Jan and what Jan has done um, at Glide. It's really about the lives that have been touched and the lives that have been changed where they have taken the opportunity on tie that knot and tie it to a community that says, you know, you are part of the entire fabric. We are, we are together. Two quick things. What, 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 what turns you on the most? What makes you the, what, what do you love about life? A couple words. Oh. Not a lot, it's gonna, it's gonna be short, it's like a sense of, and it doesn't have to, it could be for today. But what do you love about life? I love, um, I love creating. I love creating with people. Um, you know, you've got to take a shot of this mosaic that we did together. It really is literally shards of women that have come together and been grouted together in a community, a mosaic of power and hope. It's amazing. I love how the process of recovering and healing and finding voice. I love that process. And whether it is through the written word or the spoken word or through telling your story or through the circle, what, you know, to discover our voices and to discover how similar we are is this true joy to me. And, you know, I mean, one, the, the story is that one of the women in our group came in and she was really, really hurting physically as well as, as emotionally. And she said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm taking this step, I'm going to do this. And we started in on the project, and she had shared her vision for the art piece, and we all joined in, and we all began working on it. And she started healing, and we revealed ourselves, and we were, you know, we were engaged. We said, this is what empowerment really is. It is really being able to take that hurt and turn it into something that is powerful. Turn it into something that is productive. Turn it into something that, will, that really lifts somebody else up. That's what, that's what our pain can do. You know, it can, it really can. When it's shared and when it is the truth, it can lift other people up. Are you I work very hard to um, create
create beauty. And I work really hard to make sure my legs don't atrophy. So I lift weights. I, and you can't put this in. But I lifted, I, I mean, I was up to 800 pounds on my legs. Yeah. You can't put this in the thing. But I mean, yeah, you know, on the leg press. Um, Just got one more question. And I, you know, I mean, my hairdresser is my best friend. <laughs> And I, I, you know, like, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to let you see the real color of my gray. Anyway, yes? But when you look at my kids, when you look in the mirror, you go, I'm looking good. Um, I, if I look in the mirror and I go, okay, not yet. When women say to me, you know, when you're shaking your hands up there and you're singing, we shall overcome, you don't have any turkey waddle, I go, yeah. <laughs> I think the most significant part of coming out with my story was that, you know, it inspired, and it, well, it helped, and it opened up the opportunity for other people to stand up and tell their story. Tell the story. Tell, actually, tell like I don't know what happened that day. Um, Cecil asked me. Yeah, Cecil asked me if, you know, he could tell the people, tell the congregation what it felt like to be the husband of a survivor of incest. And I said, I volunteered to tell the story. I said it'd probably be easier if I told them myself, and then you could tell your story. And he, before I knew it, he said, yeah, that would really be great. And I stood up, and I told the story of having been molested from the age of, for about 11 years of my childhood, by a number of adult males in my family. And it was um, a very, very shameful and traumatic um, experience, and it was so much so that it chained me into silence for years and years after. Um, my mother broke her silence about the camps in 1981, and I believe in some ways that she modeled the power of what breaking your silence can do, and how freeing and, and liberating that releasing of the voice and the story is. And so when I did work up the courage to tell my story about the incest, and I saw these women standing up, it was, and men too, it was um, so inspiring for me. Because I feel like that's, I, I feel like that's what saves lives. It's when you, when you have the courage to break the silence and tell the truth, then you're saving your own life, but you don't know how many other lives you're touching. And it's, that's the miracle. The miracle is that, you know, just seeing people standing up and saying, yeah, that happened to me, and yes, I'm going to make it, and yes, let's, let's do something. I mean, it's, and, and where I am today with that, you know, that happened in 1982, but where I am today with that is, that, you know, it's about movement. It's, 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 beyond, it's about moving beyond breaking that silence into action and into, into community and making sure that other people benefit from the ability and the courage that you have, that you've taken, to tell your story. That's where the hope is. We love you. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Jesus, Allah, and Buddha, too. That was awesome. That's oh. beautiful. Perfect. Yeah. Is there anything you else you want to say? You know, I feel like I've just been bumbling along for you know, hours. You said that last time. I, I, that's but why I we do. Have editing, and we have, you talked about each of these things. I really think you did. We'll get a, yeah. a bug with a pen. We'll get a <laughs> bug with a pen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get, we we'll, we're going to reenact Cecil asking you.
You were going to do a movement shot on the freeway, like all the cars wishing yep. by. Yep. Jan, how, why don't we get married? Yep. Not very romantic. And I wish I had a good point. If there's something really that we're, we really feel like, oh my God, we need a few lines of this, we can come in and get it and just get this, just get audio. We don't have to go through all of this, but just get a little bit of audio if we really feel like we're missing some important piece. You know, I feel like I was so much more efficient when the first time we talked about this, Arusha. Oh, it's just the way it is. I mean, you don't have three lights on you. And, hey, talk to me intimately 10 feet away. Yeah, you right. know what I mean? It's not yeah. And you can, and but do you think I've covered all this stuff that I told you the first yes. time? Only three hours longer. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, it's, you know, these, you're going to have to be tapes. short lights. This, that's what I'm thinking is that this is going to be amazing at some point, maybe even to make a longer, a longer piece just about you and your story. Gold. Really? Yeah. I'm not talking much about programs, huh? I feel like no, it wasn't no. very... Are you saying because you'd like to be talking more about programs? Well, I mean, I feel like no. I didn't make the connections yeah. enough. Yeah. I mean, that's, okay. That's fine. Yeah, the, uh, and, and we know. This was just, who are you about? What's Jan about? You are committed to making sure all of these things happen and you're doing it through these programs, but you don't need to get into the details. Yeah. I think we hit that. I yes, yeah, right, 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 you're right. You want to make 